Hello everyone and welcome to the coronavirus edition of the 13th lecture from our signal theory class. In this lecture I will talk about modulations. First, let me explain what the modulations are for. Imagine that you want to build a radio link, you want to record for example speech at one end and you want to listen to that speech at the other end. Now the simplest thing that you can do is to take a microphone and amplify whatever signal that microphone has recorded and put that amplified signal into the antenna. Then at the other end you have an antenna, you amplify whatever you have received and put that to the speaker. So in this setup you are transmitting pretty much the same signal as you have recorded. In theory, this setup could work however you are going to face the two significant problems. The first is the difficulty to construct the antenna which would need to be very large. To create the electromagnetic waves efficiently, the size of this antenna needs to be at least comparable to the wavelengths of those electromagnetic waves. If you want to check this out, try to create waves in some body of water with your hand. You will see that if you move your hand with just the right speed, you can easily create waves with wavelength similar to the size of your hand. But if you move your hand really slowly, you will not create any significant slow and long waves. If you wanted to create slow waves with the wavelengths of several meters, you simply cannot do it with a single hand. To excite slow waves with a long wavelength, you would need to push on the water with a much bigger body than is your hand. And it's going to be very similar with the electromagnetic waves. The human speech is mostly within the frequency interval from 100 Hz to 8 kHz. And if you'd converted this type of audio signal to the electromagnetic waves directly, you would get electromagnetic waves with wavelength hundreds of kilometers long. Such waves would need to be created by a similarly sized antenna which is completely prohibitive. The second problem you are going to face is that in this setup you can really transmit only one channel. If you had multiple transmitters and multiple receivers, everything would get mixed up in the air and everyone would be listening to everyone else. So how do you really create a wireless link where you can transmit with small antennas and many people can transmit without mutual interference? The trick is that after you record the signal, you do not transmit it directly like in this case, but you encode it so that the spectrum of the signal, the frequency content of the signal, is shifted to some higher frequencies and only after the signal is shifted to these higher frequencies, you transmit it. The process of shifting of the frequency content of the signal to the higher frequencies is called the modulation and here it is performed by the modulator. Using the modulation will give you two advantages. Because now the signal is shifted to higher frequencies, you can radiate it with a smaller antenna which is much easier to construct. The second advantage is that you can transmit multiple channels using so-called frequency multiplex. Now you can have multiple transmitters, but each of these transmitters will modulate its signal to a different frequency band. So for example in this frequency band you will have one radio station, in this frequency band you will have another radio station, and in this frequency band you will have the third radio station. Now these radio stations are very nicely separated in the frequency domain. So in the receiver you will pick up only one channel, only one radio station with a bandpass filter, then you amplify the signal and demodulate it, which means that you take whatever is at those high frequency and you put it back where it started from. And then you can listen to your radio station. So this is how we often use the process of modulation and demodulation. You typically start with some low frequency input signal and then you modulate it, which typically includes shifting the signal to some higher frequencies. Then you transmit your signal, for example through an antenna, and you may or may not use this kind of frequency multiplex. Then on the receiving side you will pick your channel and demodulate it, which will give you the original signal which you started with. 
Typically, the modulation is not doing only this frequency shift. There is typically some additional stuff going on. And this additional stuff will depend on the type of modulation, of which there are many, and I will teach you about some of them on the following slides. The first modulation type I will tell you about is so-called amplitude modulation. To do the amplitude modulation, you will start with the modulating signal, which is a low frequency signal, for example, that speech signal that you want to transmit. Here, as an example, I will use this sine wave. Now, to amplitude modulate this low frequency modulating signal, I will use a carrier signal. The carrier signal is a high frequency signal with frequency that is in the middle of the bandwidth where I want to move this low frequency signal. Now to do the amplitude modulation itself, I will change the immediate amplitude of the carrier signal so that this amplitude follows the modulating signal. Here you can see that the immediate amplitude of this modulated signal follows the immediate values of this modulating signal. So the low frequency modulating signal is now encoded in the amplitude of the high frequency modulated signal. Thus the name amplitude modulation. Mathematically you can write it like this. This cosine represents your carrier and this is the carrier frequency. This is some high frequency which sits in the middle of the bandwidth where you want to move your low frequency modulating signal. This number one is the default amplitude of your carrier. And here you can increase or decrease the amplitude of your carrier with your modulating signal. So if this modulating signal is positive, the amplitude of the carrier will get bigger, and if this modulating signal is negative, the amplitude of your carrier will get smaller. This constant M will decide how big an effect will have your modulating signal on the amplitude of your carrier, and this constant is called the modulation depth. Graphically, you can draw the schematic of the amplitude modulation like this. You will take that low frequency modulating signal, multiply it by the modulation depth at number 1, that is this, and then you will take the result and multiply it with the carrier. That will give you the amplitude modulated signal. Clearly, the modulated signal can be at higher frequency than the modulating signal, so it will be much easier to transmit this modulated signal through an antenna. Now, how do you demodulate this signal? When you receive the amplitude modulated signal, how do you get back the original modulating signal? For example, how do you get back your speech? Here I will show you a very trivial approach and later I will show you how to do it more sophistically. So here I have an amplitude modulated signal and to demodulate it means that I would need to get its immediate amplitude. To do it, I will first rectify the signal. When I rectify this signal, I will get this signal. To this signal, I will apply a low-pass filter. When I low-pass filter this signal, the fast changes will be suppressed, and the only thing that will be left is a slow trend in this signal, which will be this. And this corresponds to the amplitude of the original amplitude modulated signal. So a very simple combination of a rectifier and a low pass filter will give me the immediate amplitude of the input signal and that amounts to the amplitude demodulation. Back in the day when the amplitude modulated radio stations were more common and you lived nearby a transmitter, you could actually build a very simple radio receiver like this. You just used a diet which you then connected to a speaker. That speaker also acted as a low pass filter. And when you connected this side of the diet to some large metal structure which acted as an antenna, you could actually hear the strongest radio station in your speaker. So one of the advantages of the amplitude modulation is that it is very simple to build a rudimentary amplitude demodulator. In this slide we will take a closer look at the amplitude modulation, specifically we will take a look at its spectrum.
So this is the mathematical formula for the amplitude modulation. And when I distribute this multiplication, I will get this. To find what is the spectrum of this expression, I need to realize that this cosine and this cosine both can be written as the sum of these two exponentials. So this expression can also be written in this form. This cosine will give me these two exponentials. The multiplication of the modulating signal with this complex exponential will give me this expression. And the multiplication of the modulating signal with this complex exponential will give me this expression. Now from this formula, I will be able to read what will the spectrum of the amplitude modulated signal look like. The spectrum of this complex exponential will be the Dirac delta pulse at the frequency omega c at this frequency omega c, which is the carrier frequency of my signal. The spectrum of this complex exponential will also be a Dirac delta pulse, except at the frequency of minus omega c, this minus omega c, which is the negative carrier frequency. Now, what is the spectrum of the modulating signal multiplied by this complex exponential? To find that, we need to recall what is the Fourier transform of a signal multiplied by this complex exponential. We had this in some of the early lectures, but here I will repeat it. So to find what is the spectrum of this signal, we just need to substitute it into the definition of the Fourier transform, which I have here. Then I can combine these two exponentials, these two exponentials like this. And when I do that, I will get this expression. And this expression is nothing but the Fourier transform of this signal, except at the frequency omega minus omega sub c. Consequently, the result is the spectrum of this signal, except at the frequency omega minus omega sub c. This subtraction of omega sub c means that this spectrum is shifted in frequency by omega sub c. So when I take a signal in the time domain and multiply it by e to the j omega sub c times t, in the spectral domain I will get the spectrum of my signal except it will be shifted in frequency by omega sub c. Now here I have my modulating signal which is multiplied by this complex exponential. And let's say that this modulating signal has the amplitude spectrum that looks for example like this. Now when I multiply the modulating signal by this complex exponential, in the spectral domain, the spectrum of this signal, that is this spectrum, will be shifted by omega sub c. So if this is the spectrum of my low frequency modulating signal, after the multiplication by this complex exponential, this spectrum will be shifted by omega sub c. So it will be no longer centered around zero, but it will become centered around the omega sub c. This expression says that this spectrum comes here. Now, this expression is very similar to this one, except now here I have minus omega c. So this expression will give me the spectrum of the modulating signal, but now it will be shifted to the frequency minus omega c. So again, if I take this as an example of the spectrum of the modulating signal, this expression will take this and put it here, centered at the frequency of minus omega c. So the overall spectrum of the amplitude modulated signal will contain two Dirac delta pulses. This is one and this is the second one. And then it will contain two copies of the spectrum of the modulating signal. The first copy will be created by taking the spectrum of the modulating signal and frequency shifting it to the carrier frequency omega sub c. The second copy will be created by taking the spectrum of the modulating signal and frequency shifting it to the negative carrier frequency, minus omega sub c. From this spectrum, we can read some properties of the amplitude modulation. Firstly, the presence of this Dirac delta pulse and this Dirac delta pulse means that we have some wasted energy in the spectrum. Those Dirac delta pulses do not really carry any information. If you put that amplitude modulated signal into an antenna, those Dirac delta pulses are just wastefully radiated.
The second property is that the same information is actually transmitted twice. Watch this. If we are dealing with a real modulating signal, that's for example a speech, then its spectrum is going to be symmetric. The information contained in the positive frequencies of the spectra is going to be the same as the information contained in the negative frequencies of the spectra. That means that in the spectrum of the amplitude modulated signal, the information contained in this part of the spectrum is the same as the information contained in this part of the spectrum. Thus, we are transmitting the same information twice and the spectrum is used inefficiently. If this omega sub max is the maximum frequency contained in our modulating signal, then the bandwidth needed to transmit our modulating signal is actually twice that maximum frequency. Uh, why do we care? Well, we want to put as many radio stations into the air as we can. And each of those radio stations need to have some allocated bandwidth, which will not overlap with a different bandwidth where a different radio stations will be transmitting. Now, if a single radio station takes a lot of bandwidth, that will limit the number of radio stations we can put out there simultaneously without interference. So if we want to transmit a lot of radio stations simultaneously without interference, the inefficient bandwidth usage is a very bad thing. Now a couple of other properties of the amplitude modulation. The amplitude modulation is very simple to implement, which is favorable. However, next to the inefficient bandwidth usage, it is also quite sensitive to additive noise. If you have an amplitude modulated signal, this signal is transmitted wirelessly, and during that wireless transmission you have, for example, a lightning strike, you will end up with an additive noise with this spike in your received signal. Now, during the modulation, this spike is going to affect the immediate amplitude of your received signal, which means that it will affect your demodulated signal. This spike is going to create some interference in your demodulated signal. And this is what always happens with the amplitude modulation. But later, you will see that there are other types of modulation which are able to reject this type of additive interference. Before I will talk about the other modulation types, I also want to mention the digital variants of the amplitude modulation. These digital variants of the amplitude modulation are used for the digital signals, that is the signals that represent only two logical values, 0 and 1. For these digital signals, the amplitude modulation can be used in two ways. The first way is called the amplitude shift keying, and the other way is called the on-off keying. In the amplitude shift keying, the logical 0 is transmitted as the carrier signal with some amplitude and the logical 1 is transmitted as the carrier signal with some greater amplitude. So the logical zeros and 1s are encoded as different amplitudes of the carrier signal. In the on-off keying, when the digital signal is at the level of the logical 0, we turn the transmitter off. And when the digital signal is at the level of logical 1, we turn the transmitter on. So in the on-off keying, the logical 0 and logical 1 are encoded as the transmitter turned off and the transmitter turned on, respectively. The on-off keying has the advantage of being very easy to implement. You just need an oscillator and a switch with which you will turn the output of that oscillator on and off. In this slide, I will tell you about a more advanced type of the amplitude modulation. I will tell you about so-called quadrature amplitude modulation or QAM. Why do we need this quadrature amplitude modulation? Well, the quadrature amplitude modulation will help us to solve the problems of the amplitude modulation that we had on the previous slides. What were these problems? Well, recall that if, for example, this was the magnitude spectrum of the modulating signal, then the spectrum of the modulated signal looked like this, and it essentially had two problems. The first problem was this Dirac delta pulse, which carried no information and was essentially just a wasted energy. The second problem was that the bandwidth was used inefficiently. This part of the bandwidth carried the same information as this part of the bandwidth. So we were transmitting the same information twice, using twice the bandwidth that was really needed to transmit this piece of information. Now, why do we have these problems? 
Well, we are transmitting the same information twice. We have this symmetry here because the spectrum of the modulating signal is symmetric. And the spectrum of the modulating signal is symmetric because the modulating signal is real. So I could say that one of the reasons of the inefficiency is that we use the real modulating signal, which makes its spectrum symmetric. It gives us this symmetry and we are transmitting the same information twice. The other reason for inefficiency was that we were actually using a suboptimal modulation technique. The amplitude modulation that we had on the previous slide was not as good as it could be. Now, to solve these problems, these inefficiencies of the amplitude modulation, we used the quadrature amplitude modulation, which solves our problems in the following manner. First, instead of real modulating signal, we will use a complex modulating signal. A complex modulating signal will actually contain two signals at once. One signal will be the real part and the other signal will be the imaginary part of our complex modulating signal. So this complex modulating signal could carry twice the information in comparison with a real modulating signal. Now, when we use a complex modulating signal, its spectrum will no longer have the symmetry there will no longer be this symmetry in the spectrum of a complex modulating signal. This actually makes sense intuitively. With complex modulating signal, you can potentially have twice the information in the same spectrum, so there is less room for redundancies. Okay, now that we have found a way how to stuff twice the information into the modulating signal, breaking the symmetry of its spectrum, how do we modulate the signal efficiently without creating these wasteful Dirac delta pulses? Well, the modulation can be performed efficiently by creating only a spectral shift given by this formula from the previous slides. Essentially, all I need to do in the spectral domain is to take the spectrum of my modulating signal and shift it to higher frequencies. And I know how to do the frequency shift. All I need to do is to take my modulating signal in the time domain and multiply it by this complex exponential. This omega sub c will dictate how big a frequency shift I will get. So, to create my high frequency modulated signal, I will take my low frequency modulating signal and multiply it by this complex exponential. Now, forget about this part of my formula and forget about this one half. Let's see what would happen if for the modulation I used only this expression. Well, with this expression, the spectrum of my modulating signal would get shifted in the frequency by omega sub c. This would move to higher frequencies and there would be nothing in the negative part of the spectrum. This would not be here. But this would be a problem. If I had some stuff in the positive part of the spectrum and I had only zeros in the negative part of the spectrum, the spectrum of my modulated signal would not be symmetric, which would mean that my modulated signal is complex. This signal would be complex. Mathematically, that would not be a problem, but physically you cannot really put a complex signal into an antenna. You can put voltage or a current into an antenna. But neither voltage nor current are complex, they correspond to real signals. So I very much need my modulated signal to be real. That means that I need its spectrum to be symmetric. And that means that if I put some stuff to the positive part of the spectrum, I need to put the same stuff to the negative part of the spectrum. How do I do that? Well, I just need to take the spectrum of my modulating signal, mirror it, along the vertical axis and then frequency shifted by minus omega sub c. That will give me this part of the spectrum for the negative frequencies, which will be the mirror image of this part of the spectrum for the positive frequencies. And now that the spectrum is symmetric, the modulated signal will be real, it can be represented as a voltage or a current and we can feed it into an antenna and transmit it. But how exactly do I do that mirroring and frequency shift? Well, we do know how to do the frequency shift. That means just multiplication by this complex exponential. But if you want to do the mirroring, you need to know that the trick is the complex conjugate. 
Let me explain. If you take the Fourier transform of a complex conjugate signal and you substitute into the definition formula, you will get this expression. This expression you can actually rewrite into this form. This complex conjugation now came here, and because this complex conjugation is now applied even to this complex exponential, this minus sign disappeared. Now, this expression is actually just the Fourier transform of this signal, except at negative frequency omega. So this entire expression will be the spectrum of my signal x, but at the negative frequency omega and complex conjugate. So if you take the complex conjugate of your signal in the time domain, in the spectral domain, your spectrum will flip along the vertical axis and it will also be the complex conjugate. And that is the exact symmetry we need to achieve in the spectrum of a real signal. So if in my modulation I will use this part that will create this part of the spectrum, I will also need to use this part that will create this symmetric part of the spectrum. When I do that, my modulated signal will be real. Now, why do you have this one half here and this one half here? Uh, they are here mostly for aesthetic reasons. I will do some calculations with this formula. And if I did not have these one halves here, I would needs to use some multiplication by 2 at the end. And these calculations are actually quite nifty because they will show us how to rewrite this formula for our modulation so that we do not have to deal with complex exponentials and complex signals and complex multiplications. So let's see how that goes. First, what I need to do is to substitute for my modulating signal this. So I will explicitly write that my modulating signal consists of the real part and the imaginary part. And I will do that here, that will be the first substitution, and I will also do that here. When I substitute for this, I will get this. Also, I will write that this complex exponential can be written as this sum of cosine and j times the sine. And this complex exponential can be written as the difference of this cosine and j times the sine. So when I do the substitutions, I will get this formula in which a lot of stuff will cancel each other out. And what I will be left with is this. So this expression for my modulation can be rewritten into this form. And you can see that there are no complex operations here. This formula consists of real signals, which is very convenient if I want to implement it in hardware. All I need to do is to take the real part of my modulating signal and multiply it by the cosine. Then I will subtract the imaginary part of my modulating signal multiplied by this sign. That will give me my high frequency modulated signal that can be then amplified and fed into antenna. This is the schematic of my modulation. I will take the real part of my modulating signal and multiply it by this cosine. I will also take the imaginary part of my modulating signal and multiply it by this minus sign. Finally, I will put everything together, which will create my modulated signal. So this is how you can perform the quadrature amplitude modulation. The quadrature amplitude modulation will no longer transmit the same information twice and it will no longer waste the energy in this Dirac delta pulse. In addition, the quadrature amplitude modulation will be able to transmit two signals within the bandwidth in which the amplitude modulation was able to transmit only one signal we say that the quadrature amplitude modulation is more spectrally efficient. Last, a little bit of nomenclature. This signal with the subscript i, which is multiplied by this cosine, is called the in-phase signal. This signal with the subscript q, which is multiplied by this minus sign, is called the quadrature signal. Where do these names come from? Well, if you take this cosine and you shift it by 90 degrees, you will get this minus sign. That phase shift by 90 degrees is called the quadrature. So this signal is modulated by this cosine, which we consider to be without phase shift, thus the name in phase. But this signal is modulated by this sign, which is phase shifted by 90 degrees by the quadrature, thus the name quadrature. Also, the whole thing is called the quadrature amplitude modulation.
There is actually one more thing I want to point out. This complex modulating signal we can write in this rectangular form, but we can also write it in this polar form. In this polar form, this signal A of t would give us the magnitude of this complex number, and the signal phi of t would give us the phase of this complex number. Actually, if this was just a complex number, this magnitude and this phase would be constant. But this is actually a signal. So this amplitude and this phase are changing in time. They tell us what is the amplitude and phase at some immediate moment given by this time t. Thus, we call them the immediate amplitude and the immediate phase. Now, let's assume that the signal has been quadrature amplitude modulated, transmitted and received. Now, we want to demodulate it. We want to get our modulating signal back. For this purpose, I will show you three approaches. The first one will be simple, the second will be theoretical and the last one will be practical. The approach number one. So, we have received our signal and this is its spectrum. It is the quadrature amplitude modulated signal, so to get the modulating signal back, all we need to do is take this part of the signal and shift it so that this point will come here. How do we do this? First I will show you in these pictures and then I will show you mathematically. First, in the spectrum we will remove everything that sits at negative frequencies and replace it with zero. This part of the spectrum we will set to zero and that will give us a spectrum that looks like this. This spectrum is zero for negative frequencies and only for positive frequencies it can be non-zero. And now we will take this part of the spectrum and shift it in frequency to the left by omega c. We will shift it like this. And when we do this, we will get the spectrum of our modulating signal. So basically these two steps are the demodulating procedure. Now let's take a look how it is done mathematically. First we will take our modulated signal and we will put it into the spectral domain by computing the Fourier transform. Now we need to zero out the negative frequencies. So we will take the spectrum and multiply it by the unit step. This unit step is zero for negative frequencies, so it will force all these values to be zero. This number two is here for the aesthetic reasons. If we did not use it, we would have to multiply by two somewhere else. Now the result of this multiplication will be a spectrum that we will denote as y sub a of omega. Now this frequency shift we will perform by the multiplication by this complex exponential in the time domain. To do this, we first need to take this spectrum and by computing the inverse Fourier transform, put it back into the time domain. Once we have the signal with this spectrum in the time domain, we can take it and multiply it by this complex exponential, which will perform this frequency shift. And when we perform this frequency shift, we will get our modulating signal back. So the result of this multiplication will be our modulating signal. From this complex modulating signal, we can extract its inline part and the quadrature part as the real and the imaginary part, or we can extract its immediate amplitude and the immediate phase. Now a little bit of nomenclature. This signal with this spectrum, where all the negative frequencies has been zero out, is called the analytic signal. So this demodulation can be performed by computing the analytic signal and then multiplying the analytic signal by this complex exponential. This is actually very simple to do in MATLAB. To compute the analytic signal from your modulated signal, you can use the function Hilbert. Why it is called Hilbert you will see in the next slide. Once you have the analytic signal, you can just multiply it by this exponential and that will give you the demodulated signal. From the demodulated signal, you can take the real part and that will give you the in-phase component and you can take the imaginary part, which will give you the quadrature component. When you take the absolute value, that will give you the immediate amplitude and when you take the phase, you will get the immediate phase. This is actually an alternative way how to get the immediate amplitude without computing this step. You can actually compute it directly from the analytic signal and here you can see why.
When you want to compute this immediate amplitude, you need to compute the magnitude of this complex signal. You need to compute the magnitude of this complex signal. You need to compute this magnitude. Now, when for this signal, I substitute this, I will get this. And when I distribute this magnitude to both these signals, I will get this. And here I need to realize that the magnitude of this complex exponential is just 1. So this magnitude, this immediate amplitude can be computed as the magnitude of the analytic signal. So once I have my analytic signal computed, I can just compute its absolute value and that will give me the immediate amplitude of my demodulated signal. One more thing I want to point out is the connection of the quadrature amplitude modulation with the amplitude modulation. This was the formula for the amplitude modulation which we had in one of the previous slides. Now this expression you can actually write in this form where this signal x sub y will be this and this signal x sub q will be equal to zero. But this formula is the expression for the quadrature modulation. So you can actually perform the amplitude modulation with the quadrature amplitude modulation. You just need to set the in-phase component to be equal to this and the quadrature component to be equal to zero. Or in other words, the modulating signal in the quadrature amplitude modulation needs to be equal to this. This connection also means that you can use these steps to demodulate amplitude modulated signal. You just need to compute the analytic signal, perform this multiplication, and then when you take the real part of your demodulated signal, you will get this, from which you can extract the signal which was used for the amplitude modulation. So this was the first approach for the quadrature amplitude demodulation. On the next slide we will do the second approach which will be a little bit more theoretical. So in this slide I will show you another approach to the quadrature amplitude demodulation. This approach will be based on the Hilbert transform. The Hilbert transform is a way how to compute the analytic signal. Once you have the analytic signal, you can use the same procedures that I showed you on the previous slide to do the demodulation. So in this slide, I will just show you how to compute the analytic signal using the Hilbert transform. So let's say I have a signal y of t and I want to turn it into the analytic signal. One way how to do it was shown in the previous slide. In a few words, you need to compute the spectrum of your signal, then you need to zero out the spectrum for negative frequencies, and then you need to compute the inverse Fourier transform, which will give you your analytic signal. Now, there is yet another way how to compute the analytical signal, which is based on the Hilbert transform. To compute the analytical signal, you will first take the original signal, y of t. This signal is typically real. To this real signal, you will then add this imaginary part, which is composed of this j multiplied by this signal y sub h. Now, if you choose this signal y sub h properly, and in this manner you will add it to this original signal y of t, you will turn this original signal into the respective analytic signal. This magical signal that needs to be added here is called the Hilbert transform of your signal. So if you take your signal and you will add the Hilbert transform of your signal like this, you will turn your signal into the respective analytic signal. Now, how can we find this Hilbert transform of our signal? This is best seen in the spectral domain. So to explain, I will apply the Fourier transform to this expression, which will turn it into this one where I will be adding the spectra. So in the time domain, I have that the analytic signal is given by the sum of my original signal plus j times the Hilbert transform. In the spectral domain, I will have that the spectrum of the analytical signal will be given as the sum of the spectrum of my original signal plus j times the spectrum of the Hilbert transform. Now recall from the previous slide what was the spectrum of the analytical signal. The spectrum of the analytical signal was zero for negative frequencies and for the positive frequencies it was almost the same as the spectrum of the original signal. The only difference is the multiplication by this number too. So for positive frequencies the spectrum of the analytic signal is twice the spectrum of the original signal. 
let's use it here. So this is the spectrum of the analytic signal and that will be equal to zero for negative frequencies and for positive frequencies it will be twice the spectrum of the original signal. Now the important question. What do I need to add into the spectrum of the original signal so that this entire expression will become the spectrum of the analytic signal? Well, this is what I need to add. Let's check it out. When I take this and I substitute it here, I will get this. For positive frequencies, I will get the original spectrum plus j times, and now I'm substituting this, minus j times the original spectrum. Here, this j times this minus j will become 1, so I will have the original spectrum plus the original spectrum, which will give me 2 times the original spectrum, and that is what I need to get. Now, for negative frequencies, I will have the original spectrum plus j times, and now I substitute this, that is j times the original spectrum. Here, j times j will become minus 1, so what I will have is the original spectrum minus the original spectrum, and that will turn into 0. Again, the 0 is exactly what I'm supposed to get here. So, this is what I need to substitute here to get my analytic signal, which means that this is the spectrum of the Hilbert transform of my signal. This is the spectrum of this Hilbert transform of my signal. And here I can see that to compute the spectrum of the Hilbert transform of my signal, I need to take the spectrum of my original signal and multiply it by minus j for positive frequencies and multiply it by j for negative frequencies. This multiplication by minus j and j I can write in this form, where this is the spectrum of the original signal and this function omega of h is given as minus j for positive frequencies and j for negative frequencies. When I take this h of omega and I multiply the spectrum of the original signal by this h of omega, I will get this, which is the spectrum of the Hilbert transform. Now take a look at this expression. I will read it again. To get the spectrum of the Hilbert transform, we need to take the spectrum of the original signal and multiply it by some function h of omega. Well, this type of operation we had many times before, and it corresponds to a signal with spectrum y of omega passing through a system with the frequency characteristic h of omega. So the Hilbert transform actually seems to be some kind of LTI system with this frequency characteristic. So let's take a look at what kind of frequency characteristic this is. Here I have it written down. Again, that frequency characteristic is minus j for positive frequencies and j for negative frequencies. So the magnitude frequency characteristic will always be 1 and the phase characteristic will be minus pi over 2 for positive frequencies and pi over 2 for negative frequencies. Overall, it would seem that the frequency characteristic that represents the Hilbert transform does not change the amplitude of our signal, but it will change the phase. It will perform this phase shift for positive frequencies and this phase shift for negative frequencies. Therefore, you can often see the Hilbert transform expressed in this form. It is a system which is indicated by this box. Into this system you feed your original signal y of t and at the output of the system you will get your Hilbert transform. Into this box we often write that the phase shift is minus pi over 2 which corresponds to this minus pi over 2 for positive frequencies. It is automatically understood that for the negative frequencies the phase shift will have opposite sign to keep the symmetry in the spectrum. Now to summarize, if I want to compute the analytic signal from the original signal, I can do it by adding j times the Hilbert transform of my original signal. And this Hilbert transform can be computed from my original signal by pathing it through a system with this frequency characteristic. Now because all of this is not yet sufficiently obscure, I will make it a little bit more complicated.
The complication that I will introduce is that I will express this filtering, the passage of this signal through this system in the time domain. To do that, I will first need to find the impulse response of this system. That I will find by taking the frequency characteristic, the frequency characteristic, and computing its inverse Fourier transform. The computation of this inverse Fourier transform is actually not trivial, but if you crunch the mass, you can find that the inverse Fourier transform of this function is 1 over t, and this is the impulse response of this system. Now to compute how the output signal is computed from the input signal, I need to compute the convolution of the input signal with the impulse response of the system. And that is what I have here. The output of the system, that is the Hilbert transform, will be the convolution of the input signal, that is the original signal, and the impulse response which we have computed to be 1 over t. This convolution can be written in this form and this expression is often used as the formal definition of the Hilbert transform. Actually, most of the time, this definition is also multiplied by a constant, 1 over pi, but uh, for the sake of simplicity, uh, here I left that constant out. Actually, for most of you, it is rather unlikely that you will ever evaluate this integral to get the Hilbert transform of your signal in order to compute the analytical signal. But at minimum, you should be able to identify that this integral is the definition of the Hilbert transform. Then you can interpret it as the convolution of the original signal with the impulse response 1 over t and that this corresponds to the original signal being passed through this system which introduces this phase shift to the spectral components. Also, you should know that when you take the Hilbert transform of your signal and you add it to your original signal like this, you will get the analytic signal. Thus far the theory of the Hilbert transform. But if you will ever need to compute the analytic signal in the future, you will probably do it like this. Now, in MATLAB, there is a function called Hilbert, but be aware that this function does not really compute the Hilbert transform, it directly computes the analytic signal. And in this analytic signal, its real part will be the same as the original signal, and the imaginary part will be the Hilbert transform of your original signal. In this slide, I will tell you about the third approach to the quadrature amplitude demodulation. This approach does not require any spectrum computation or complex operations, therefore it is the most convenient for the implementation in hardware. To demodulate the in-phase component of your signal, all you need to do is to take your modulated signal and multiply it by two times of this cosine. Let's see how it works. To analyze this expression, I will first rewrite this 2 times cosine as these two complex exponentials. Now I will distribute this multiplication, which will give me this. In this expression, I have my modulated signal multiplied by this complex exponential and the same modulated signal multiplied by this complex exponential. Now recall that multiplying by a complex exponential like this one means a frequency shift in the spectral domain. So the spectrum of this expression will be the spectrum of my modulated signal, frequency shifted by omega c, and the spectrum of this expression will be the spectrum of my modulated signal, frequency shifted by minus omega c. So for example, if this is the spectrum of my modulated signal, that is the spectrum of this y of t, then the spectrum of this entire expression will be this red spectrum, which consists of this part and this part. And both of these parts are created by frequency shifted this spectrum by omega c to the right. Similarly, the spectrum of this entire expression will be this green spectrum consisting of this part and this part. This green spectrum is created by frequency shifting this spectrum by omega c to the left. Now, when I add this expression and this expression in the spectral domain, I will be adding this green and the red spectra. And that will actually give us the demodulation of the in-phase component. To understand why the demodulation of the in-phase component happens here, we need to crunch a little bit of mouth. 
First, recall that this part of the modulated signal spectrum is created from the spectrum of the modulating signal by frequency shifting it and multiplying it by one half. Now, because the modulated signal is real, we are going to have this symmetry in the spectrum. So the spectrum for the negative frequencies is going to be complex conjugate mirror image of the spectrum for the positive frequencies. Now when this green frequency shift happens, this minus omega c is eliminated and this expression will turn into this expression. And when this red frequency shift happens, this minus omega c is eliminated and this expression will become this expression. So in this part of the spectrum, I will get the sum of these two spectra of the modulating signal. So now I will have to investigate what happens when I add the spectra of the modulating signal like this. First, let's recall that the modulating signal has these two components. The real part is the in-phase component and in the imaginary part we have that quadrature component. Now when I turn this into the spectral domain, I will get that the spectrum of the modulating signal will be given as the sum of the spectrum of the in-phase component and j times the spectrum of the quadrature component. Now let's see what happens when I take the spectrum of my modulating signal and I compute this. This I have copied here. Now to simplify it, I will take this expression for the spectrum of my modulating signal and I will substitute it here and here. When I do that, I will get this. Now I will use the fact that the in-phase component is a real signal, so its spectrum will have this symmetry, so I can rewrite this into this form. And also, the quadrature component is a real signal, so its spectrum will have this symmetry and I can rewrite this into this. Now, this part and this part will cancel each other out and this part will add up with this part. So I will get that the spectrum of this expression, that is this expression, is two times the spectrum of the in-phase component. When I multiply it by this one half, I will get that the sum of these two spectra is actually the spectrum of the in-phase component. So at the low frequencies, this signal will contain the in-phase component of my modulating signal. But this in-phase component will not be alone in this spectrum. At high frequencies, that is here and here, there will be some leftovers which were created when this part of the spectrum was frequency shifted to the left and this part of the spectrum was frequency shifted to the right. So overall, in this signal, at the low frequencies, I will have the demodulated in-phase component of my modulating signal and also I will have some undesired signals at high frequencies. But typically there is a very good frequency separation between that low frequency demodulated in-phase component and these undesired high frequency signals. So these undesired high frequency signals are very easy to remove just by applying a low pass filter to this entire signal. That low pass filter will keep this demodulated in-phase component and it will remove these undesired high frequency signals. To summarize, when you want to demodulate your in-phase component, all you need to do is to take your modulated signal, multiply it by two times this cosine, and that will give you demodulated in-phase component plus some undesired high-frequency signals. You will remove this high-frequency undesired signal by some low-pass filtering, and you will be left with this demodulated in-phase component. So this is what you need to do to demodulate your in-phase component. To get the quadrature component, you need to do something very similar. You need to take your modulated signal and multiply it by minus two times this sign. If you analyzed this expression in a similar fashion as I have done it here, you will see that this expression will actually give you the quadrature component plus some undesired high frequency signals. These undesired high frequency signals can be very easily removed by applying a low pass filter to this entire signal.
at the output of that low pass filter, you will get only this quadrature component. So this computation and this computation plus some low pass filtering are very easy way how to get the in phase and quadrature components of your modulating signal. This approach is actually quite convenient for the implementation in hardware and I will show you its schematic in the next slide. So when you want to implement the quadrature amplitude demodulation, this is what you can do. You will take your modulated signal, multiply it by two times of this cosine and then pass it through a low pass filter. The result will be the demodulated in phase component. Also, you will take your modulated signal, multiply it by minus two times this sign, low pass filter it, and the result will be the demodulated quadrature component. And this approach is suitable for the implementation in hardware. Also, it is suitable for the real time implementation. If you want to get your demodulated outputs as the modulated signal arrives, this is how you have to do it. You cannot do it through the analytic signal because in that case you need to measure the signal in its entirety, compute the analytic signal and then you can do the demodulation. Now a few words about how the quadrature amplitude modulation is used in practice. In the past, a noticeable use was the color television. The inline and quadrature components were used to encode the color coordinates. These days, the quadrature amplitude modulation is typically used for digital modulations, where we want to efficiently transfer ones and zeros. Typically, what we do is that we create so-called constellation diagram, which is a map of points in a 2D space. For example, here I have a map of 16 points and to each of these points I have assigned a binary number going from 0 to 15. Now, if for example I want to transmit this sequence of zeros and ones, I will transmit the inline component that is this big and I will transmit the quadrature component that is this big. On the receiving side, when I received this value of the inline component and this value of the quadrature component, I will know that this sequence of zeros and ones has been transmitted. In this fashion, in a single transmission burst in a so-called symbol, you can simultaneously transmit four binary values. And you can do this when you have 16 points in your constellation diagram. In this case, we talk about the 16 point quadrature amplitude modulation. These 16 points is not the only choice. You can have more points in your constellation diagram. For example, you can have 64 point quadrature amplitude modulation, in which case you would have 64 points in your constellation diagram, and in a single transmission burst, in a symbol, you would transmit one of 64 values. That corresponds to transmitting six binary values at once. So the quadrature amplitude modulation can be very spectrally efficient. Using some limited bandwidth, you can transmit a lot of data. One practical example where this is fully utilized is the digital video broadcast. OK, in this slide, I will tell you about the frequency modulation. But first, why do we need to talk about yet another type of modulation? Recall that I told you that the amplitude modulation is very sensitive to the additive noise. For example, if you transmit your signal over the air and there is a lightning strike, a spike like this can be added to your signal. When this signal is demodulated, this spike will create some interference in the demodulated amplitude. This can affect both the amplitude modulation and the quadrature amplitude modulation. But sometimes we would need a modulation technique that is a bit more robust. The solution to this problem can be the frequency modulation. Now the principle of the frequency modulation is very simple. Your modulating signal will be encoded as the frequency of the modulated signal. So for example, if your modulating signal looks like this, the modulated signal will increase its frequency when the value of the modulated signal increases and the modulated signal will decrease its frequency when the value of the modulated signal decreases.
So for example, when you frequency modulate this sine wave, you will get this. You can see that the increase, decrease, increase and decrease of the frequency of the modulated signal corresponds to the increase, decrease, increase and decrease of the value of the modulating signal. Now, how do you perform this frequency modulation? Well, first I will show you a naive approach that is very intuitive, but it actually does not work that well. So let's start with a signal that has the constant frequency of omega c. This is our carrier frequency. Now, if I want to apply the frequency modulation to this signal, intuitively, I should change this frequency. So you could expect that it would be done like this. I will just add my modulating signal to the carrier frequency. So if this signal is positive, the frequency of this entire signal will increase. And if this signal is negative, the frequency of this entire signal will decrease. Well, this is going to work a little bit, but is not going to be precise in the sense that the changes of the frequency of this entire signal are not going to correspond to the changes of the value of your modulating signal. If your modulating signal was constant, that would actually work, but the moment your modulating signal changes, it turns out that this naive approach does not really work. This is how you have to do it properly. First, let's take a look at the case where we have constant frequency. So if my signal has constant frequency, I can write it as a cosine of some phase, where that phase is equal to the frequency of the cosine times t. Basically, this is writing this in a more complicated manner. But here I can realize that a signal with constant frequency is actually cosine of a phase where that phase is a linear function of time. The frequency is the coefficient that decides how fast the phase increases. Also, note that the frequency is the derivative of the phase. When I take derivative of the phase, when I take derivative of this with respect to time, I will get the frequency of my signal. But when the frequency is the derivative of the phase, that also means that the phase is the integral function of the frequency. So what I can do is to set some frequency, integrate it like this, that will give me this phase, which I will plug into this cosine, and that will give me a signal with a constant frequency. Now we can use this approach to create the modulated frequency. You will set some carrier frequency. To that, you will add your modulated signal multiplied by some constant delta. You will integrate this, and that will give you the phase. Then you will take the phase, you will plug it into the cosine, and what you will get is the frequency modulated signal. The frequency of this signal will now actually correspond exactly to the frequency given here. So this is how you perform your frequency modulation properly. Do not be confused by this constant delta, that is just the modulation depth. This constant will decide how much the frequency will change when you have some value of your modulating signal. You can use the frequency modulation for the analog signals like in this example and for digital signals. When you use it for the digital signals, we usually refer to it as the frequency shift king. The frequency shift king works like this. You have your digital signal, which has logical zeros and logical ones. And when you have a logical zero, you will transmit lower frequency. And when you have a logical one, you will transmit higher frequency. And in this fashion, your logical zeros and ones are encoded. In the next slide, I will tell you about the demodulation of a frequency modulated signal. And there it will also be apparent why the frequency modulation is more resilient to the additive noise like this one. Let's take a look how that demodulation is done. So let's say I have a frequency modulated signal. And to make things a little bit more interesting, I will also have this additive noise. To demodulate this signal, I will perform these steps. First, I will pass my signal through this limiter. The limiter is a block which is linear in some range of the input values, but then it saturates. So the limiter will pass some range of the input values 
but when the input values are too big, the limiter will saturate and it will do it both for positive values and for the negative values. So when you pass this signal through this limiter, you will get this. You can see the top of the signal and the bottom of the signal is saturated, saturated. Now, this will not remove the frequency modulation at all. This signal is still frequency modulated. But this limiter will remove spikes like this one. And that is that very nice property of the frequency modulation. Spikes like this one can be removed without strongly affecting the frequency of the modulated signal. Now, I will take this signal and pass it through so-called discrimination filter. The discrimination filter is a filter with this type of the frequency characteristic. The crucial part is this linear ramp which rises with the frequency characteristic. And this linear ramp is positioned in the frequency so that the frequency of the modulated signal changes in this frequency band. So when I feed this signal into this discrimination filter, the high frequencies will fall somewhere here and they will be passed with high amplitude. And the low frequencies will fall somewhere here and they will be passed with low amplitude. Consequently, when this signal passes through this discrimination filter, it will look like this. High frequencies will increase in amplitude, low frequencies will decrease in amplitude. Uh, here I have to admit that this is a little bit illustrative. Uh, in reality the signal will not have these flat tops, but here I am just demonstrating the principle. And in principle this discrimination filter will turn this frequency modulated signal into the amplitude modulated signal. So now you can just use the demodulator for the amplitude modulation and you will get the signal that corresponds to the frequency of this modulated signal. This is how you could do it in hardware. It is not precise, but it is convenient to implement. Now this is how you can do it precisely in MATLAB. Remember about the analytic signal. The analytic signal we can get as the modulated signal plus J times its Hilbert transform. Also recall that the analytic signal we can write in this polar form where this is the immediate amplitude and this is the immediate phase. Now to do the frequency demodulation I can get the analytic signal, extract its phase and then take derivative of the phase. Remember, in the frequency modulation we computed the phase as the integral of the carrier frequency plus modulation depth times the modulating signal. So now when we take derivative of the phase we will get the frequency back. We will get that derivative of the phase is the carrier frequency plus the modulation depth times the modulating signal. So when we subtract the carrier frequency we will get the multiple of the modulating signal. Alternatively, you can also do it like this. First, you will take your analytic signal and multiply it by this complex exponential. This multiplication will frequency shift your signal in the spectral domain by minus omega sub c. So when you take the phase and then derivative of the phase, you will directly get your modulating signal multiplied by the modulation depth. You no longer have to subtract this carrier frequency omega c. That has already been taken care of by this exponential, which shifted the frequency spectrum of the analytic signal by minus omega c. In MATLAB you can write it like this. First you will take your modulated signal and feed it into the function Hilbert. That will give you your analytic signal. Then you will take your analytic signal and multiply it by this exponential. That is this exponential. Next, you will get the phase of your analytic signal, that is this phase. Next, you will need to unwrap your phase. What does that mean? Well, for example, if you have a complex exponential with the immediate phase given by this red line and you try to extract this phase using the function angle, the function angle will give you the phase that will be within the interval from minus pi to pi. So it will give you this blue line. That is actually mathematically correct. 
For example, if you had a complex number with this face and to this face you would add 2 pi, that is you would move here, you would still have the very same complex number. So MATLAB is mathematically correct to give you the phase within the interval from minus pi to pi. But practically we would like to have this phase that is smooth without these jumps. To get rid of these jumps and to get that smooth phase back we can use the function unwrap. This function will detect these jumps and it will try to move the phase so that it will be continuous. So for example this part of the phase will be moved here so that the resulting phase is continuous. When you unwrap the phase you can take derivative, that is this derivative, divide by the modulation depth, that is this delta, and you will get your demodulated signal. Before we continue with other modulation types, I just want to briefly summarize the properties of the frequency modulation. You have seen that the frequency modulation is more robust to additive noise than the amplitude modulation. But what we pay for it is that typically the frequency modulation is harder to implement than the amplitude modulation and also it is less spectrally efficient. You will need more bandwidth to transmit the same signal with the frequency modulation than with the amplitude modulation. In this slide I will tell you about the phase modulation. To do the phase modulation you will take a cosine at some frequency, at some carrier frequency omega sub c, and to this cosine you will add the phase using the modulating signal. This delta is again a constant called the modulation depth that will decide how much the phase will change. So for example if this is my modulating signal and this red signal is the carrier without any modulation then when I phase modulate the carrier I will get the blue signal. Check it out. When my modulating signal is zero both the carrier and the modulated signal are in phase. When my modulating signal increases the modulated signal is phase shifted to the left. Then when my modulating signal is zero again the carrier and the modulated signal are in phase again. When my modulating signal is negative the modulated signal is phase shifted to the right. So the value of the modulating signal will change the phase shift of the modulated signal. Now the phase modulation is actually very closely related to the frequency modulation. Recall that the derivative of the immediate phase will give you the immediate frequency and the integral function of the immediate frequency will give you the immediate phase. So when you modulate phase you are actually also modulating the frequency and when you are modulating the frequency you are actually also modulating the phase. To perform the demodulation of a phase modulated signal in MATLAB you need to take similar steps that we took with the frequency demodulation. First you will compute the analytic signal and then you will multiply the analytic signal by this exponential which will frequency shift the analytic signal by this omega c. Then you will take the phase of the analytic signal and last you will unwrap it. And this will give you the demodulated phase. When you use the phase modulation to encode a digital signal that will give you so-called phase shift keying. With the phase shift keying when you have logical 0 the carrier is transmitted with one phase and when you have a logical 1 the carrier is transmitted with another phase. So the logical zeros and 1s are encoded in the phase of the modulated signal. Now I will briefly talk about the pulse modulations. To illustrate how these modulations work I will use this modulating signal. First the path width modulation. The path width modulation is essentially a square wave where the duty cycle is changed according to the modulating signal. So when your modulating signal is high your duty cycle is going to be high and when your modulating signal is low your duty cycle is going to be low. Or in very simple words when your modulating signal is high you are going to output white pulses and when your modulating signal is low you are going to output narrow pulses. The PWM modulation can be used to transfer information. For example cheap servos can be controlled with the PWM modulation. But this modulation can also be used to transfer energy.
You can see that in this interval, this signal has higher energy than in this interval. So by changing the duty cycle, the path width, I can change the amount of energy that is being delivered to some load. For example, you can create a voltage like this and you can feed it to a light bulb. And in this time interval, the light bulb would shine brighter and in this interval, the light bulb would shine dimmer. And of course, you need the repetition frequency of these pulses to be high enough so that you do not see the flickering. Now, why would you go into the trouble of creating this type of signal to feed to a light bulb, when instead you could just feed it bigger or smaller voltage? Well, it turns out that with modern electronics, when you want to regulate the voltage, it is often simpler and more energy efficient to just switch something on or off than to regulate it continuously. So the PW modulation is very often used to regulate the energy or power that is being delivered to some power devices like light bulbs or motors. Now the pulse amplitude modulation is a modulation where instead of a continuous signal, you transmit pulses where the height of the pulse corresponds to the immediate value of the signal at the corresponding time you can see that the height of these pulses is following the values of this modulating signal. There is a digital variant of the pulse amplitude modulation which is called the pulse code modulation or PCM. In this digital variant you do not transmit analog pulses but instead of each pulse you transmit a number that corresponds to the height of the pulse, that is a number that corresponds to the immediate value of the modulating signal at the given time. So the modulating signal is transmitted as a sequence of numbers that are essentially the samples of the modulating signal. And this type of signal we met before and we called it the discrete signal. So a discrete signal can in fact be interpreted as a pulse code modulated analog signal. The last pulse modulation I want to talk about is the pulse position modulation. With the pulse position modulation, you transmit pulses with some constant width and the modulating signal is encoded into the position of these pulses. If this modulating signal was zero, you would transmit these pulses at the positions of these red lines. If the modulating signal is not zero and it is positive, you will transmit your pulses sooner than is this red reference position. And if your modulating signal is negative, you will transmit your pulses after this reference position. Check it out again. My signal starts at zero, so I am transmitting my pulses at the reference position. Then my signal rises, so I will transmit my pulses before the reference position. They are transmitted sooner. Then my signal goes to zero, so again I will transmit my pulses at the reference position. Next my signal decreases to some negative values, so I will transmit my pulses after the reference position. And last my signal goes to zero again, so I will again transmit my pulses at the reference position. You can use this modulation to transfer your information through some wire and it is going to be quite resilient to interference. Even if you have some additive or multiplicative interference, the position of your pulses are not going to be affected by much, so your information will remain intact. A brief summary. In previous slides you have seen that a modulation is a process of changing parameters of a carrier signal by a modulating signal. We talked about the following modulation types. The amplitude modulation, the quadrature amplitude modulation, the frequency modulation, the phase modulation, the pulse width modulation, the pulse amplitude modulation and the pulse position modulation. According to the data type, we can divide the modulations to analog and digital modulations. Among the digital modulations, we mentioned the amplitude shift keying, on off keying, frequency shift keying, phase shift keying, and pulse code modulation.